starting with Brooke Pride. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We were not we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us so that, whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. So be it. So, I got a question to ask you, and I don't want a comment to this, but did you miss me? Now, you can answer this one, did you miss my wife? Now you can answer it. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you that um, we have the opportunity to take vacations. Lord, I thank you for our family and friends. I thank you for the security that you have given us in this country and the freedom that we have to tell others of Jesus Christ. As we enter into this Christmas season, Lord, let us concentrate on telling our family, our friends, our loved ones, even our enemies, about what you have done for us through your precious Son, and that Jesus will return and take those home that believe in him. We just thank you and praise you, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you didn't know, we went to the marriage conference, and I'll tell you more about that later. The church gave us that as a gift. You didn't pay for Hawaii, don't worry, that's part of a timeshare thing. But I decided since we were going to this marriage conference to learn how to love our wives, how better to just put her on a plane and take her to Hawaii afterwards, right? So (laughs) kudos. That worked out pretty good. But we're back home, and when we got off the plane, it was 14 degrees in Spokane, and the wind was blowing 30 mile an hour. I got on my phone and was trying to find flights back out of here. (laughs) But I'm here. So, Terry, I won't be long enough for you to fall asleep today. See, I watch the sermons, and I've heard some things. Thank you for giving that compliment to Jacob. Terry Terry said that he didn't fall asleep during Jacob's preaching. I know what that implies, so that's fine. (laughs) And I did watch sermons. Don't forget that um, Logan tries to get them taped and put on and everything. Jacob's has a hiccup, and there's two on there. I don't know why, but all the information's there. And Mike's was there, and I really enjoyed being able to do that. We went to a church in Maui that we had attended before because Sherry broke her coffee cup from where we went and got one before. But they didn't give out coffee cups this time. So I just had to listen to the message, and I was blessed. It was nice to be able to go to church and hear someone else and sit with my wife for the service. So that was really neat, too. The king is coming again. When we talk about Advent, we talk about that Jesus Christ came. That's past history. Jesus Christ will come again. That is future His story. It will be history at some point. We have an opportunity now to tell others of Jesus Christ. We won't have that opportunity when we're dead and gone. We won't have that opportunity if Jesus returns. We have that opportunity to be His hands and feet now. Are you reading along with your reading? You knew I was going to ask you that. Are you? If you did, you finished the gospel presentations. You started reading Acts, and Jacob gave you a lot of information there that you don't have otherwise. And as you're reading Acts, you'll see where Galatians fits in, and we're reading that in First and Second Thessalonians and the, the letter to Corinthians. You'll see how all of that meshes together. You'll see that James, James the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, not James the brother of John because he was killed early on. We don't know what our calling in life is going to be, but we need to be obedient to that calling. To take up, to deny ourselves first so that we can take up our cross and then follow after him. That This world is our mission field. We're not saved by our works, but if we are saved, how in the world could we stay silent about what God has done for us? 
If we don't cry out, Scripture says, the rocks will. Nature cries out, and as we'll read in Romans, Paul says no one has excuse even if they haven't heard. But it is our privilege and our, our job to preach the Word of God. So as we're reading along, you notice the first book you read during your reading of Acts was James, the half-brother of Jesus, the one that grew up with Jesus, and they were talking you know, to the other disciples. Said, you remember when you went and did this thing? You know, and Jesus did, oh yeah, Jesus didn't partake in that, did he? The half-brother of Jesus saw the fact that his own brother was the Messiah. How hard would that have been for you to ever think that your brother was the Son of God? And here James is taking the head of the church in Jerusalem because he knows for a fact that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, who he said he is, who he says he will always be. And he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. So James writes this letter to the Jews that are exiled, that Jacob told you, because they're being persecuted and they're scattered abroad. Who would ever think that that would be the spreading of the church? To Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria and to the utter ends of the earth. Here they are in the other, utter ends of the earth being persecuted, but given the opportunity to tell others of Jesus Christ. So you read in James 1, starting out, this is what James says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Now let's get right to it. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not only were they getting to tell people in other parts of the country where they've lost their home, family, friends, finances, securities, whatever, so that they have to trust and rely on Jesus. They're given the opportunity to tell others about Jesus Christ, and it is maturing them and completing them. So that on that day when Jesus Christ returns, they'll know that they didn't waste their lives. Do you think they realized that at the time? <laughs> Do you and I realize it when we face things? When we look back and see the hindsight of things, it is crystal clear. We have 2020 vision that we see God's hand in that process. I mean, Scripture says that He formed us in our, his, in our mother's wombs. Why would He not have His hands on His children guiding them along if we'll just trust in Him to do it? And James says, consider this pure joy, the perfect joy and peace that you'll only understand from letting Jesus be not just your Savior, but your Lord of all. I don't think the believers realize that. I don't know when they realize that. But I know in Acts, which we read about, that when they faced this persecution, they didn't pray for it to end. They prayed for boldness so that they could preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They sold the possessions that they had so that they could give to others in need. And they met together daily, praying for others, going over the Scriptures, encouraging one another, letting the Spirit of God live and move through them in a powerful way so that we did have the birth of the church during some of the crazy Caesars that Jacob mentioned and everything else. How could this not be a, anything other than a mighty act of God? James goes on to say, though, he says, I know you say you're believers, and I'm writing this letter to all you Jews who say that you believe, but I don't know if I really believe you. Because in this, all these things that they're showing proof of, think about that, he's still saying your works don't really prove it. What? They've been persecuted and scattered abroad, and they're telling others about Jesus, but he still says you don't have that complete joy. You're not living as Christ lived. So let's think about that. Then how did Christ live? He gave up heaven. He had no place to lay his head. Think of the scripture where Christ says, if you want to be my disciples and the excuses that people made. There is no excuse. God himself became flesh and blood and died for you. 
What excuse can you possibly have for not following and living a life that Jesus commands you to live? Scriptures are clear. He says, My sheep listen to my voice. They will not listen to any other, and they will enter in through the gate and find rest for their souls. That you know that this hope that we have is confident assurance that we will have a home in eternity with God Almighty forever that He will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no suffering, no pain. But you're still here breathing and living now, given the task to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to be the light to this world, so that others may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what James was saying that he wasn't seeing. In James chapter 2, he says in verse 17, In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. But some of you will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that, and they shudder, and sometimes we fail to shudder, correct? You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Well, he didn't offer Isaac, did he? But he was willing to do that for God. He didn't understand why or how or anything else, and God was with him and guided his hand that a ram was supplied instead of his son. But he would have done whatever out of holy fear that God told him because he didn't see any other option but to obey his God. Verse 22, you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And I want to give you a little piece of advice here. We try to figure out God's plan for our lives. Good for you, <laughs> but you're not going to. Both of these examples, the people had to walk by faith that day of their life, that minute of their life. There's no way to plan for those things except to totally rely on God, to be fused to His Word, to let the Spirit empower you to understand the flesh that dwelt among us, Jesus Christ, who is the exact representation of God. They studied scriptures, they prayed, they worshiped God. So when that time in their life came, when they faced those persecutions and trials, they could walk by faith, not by sight. Because you tell me, honestly, who could walk by sight the day that Jericho was destroyed or the day that you were told to offer up your son as a sacrifice? You can't plan for those things. You have to walk by faith because sight Reasoning will tell you anything other than that. But if you put your faith, hope, in Jesus Christ, then you have a firm foundation as the song that we said sings. If you notice, verse 17 began by saying in the same way, so I want to back up a few verses. To verse 14, it says, What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. He didn't put the bar way up there, guys. He said, you're neglecting poor people. You might be telling them about Jesus, but you're not taking care of their daily needs. They're still not clothed, and they're still not fed. You know, I see, saw such absorbent wealth and such wastefulness when we went on vacation, and I see that every time, and I kind of feel guilty, but then I don't because we don't abuse that, but that's a different story. But we went to, out to Lanaya, however you say it. I'm going to say it right because they always pronounce them different. They put that accents on the, the syllables more than I do. And we were first se seen the Four Seasons Hotel there. That if you know all the story, the reason that, uh, what's his name that bought the island? The guy that does Oracle, uh, Larry Ellison, bought the island. So I've heard was so that Bill Gates couldn't buy the island. Oh, wow. <laughs> 
And the hotel there that Bill Gates rented out to have his, uh, I don't know how many rooms are there, his wedding there, he rented all the rooms. They range from $2,700 to $27,000 a night. And there are people starving in this world that don't have food, don't have clothing. And they desperately need the Word of God, too. And I have to say it again, I support the Gideons. And this seed program that the Free Methodists support looks like a good program, and we support that also. You cannot say that you're a believer and neglect human beings because they're made in the image of God. And that's what James is saying. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, this example he's just given them, faith by itself, is, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now that's James' first letter to the churches, to the Jews spread abroad. The first letter we see written. If you didn't get it from your reading, the next letter we see written is Paul's letter to the church in Galatia. Paul's letter is to a church that is doing actions, but they're kind of missing the point again because they think they need to have the actions to be saved, and that kind of discredits what Christ did on the cross, doesn't it? And the free grace that is offered to all men simply by faith, not by works of any righteousness that you've done, so you cannot boast. The only thing that you can boast in is God. Because He loved you enough that even while you were enemies, Christ died for you. He tells them to live by the Spirit of God. The power of themselves never could save them. It never will save them. It's not good enough. The law, as Paul says, only showed him how pitiful of a man he was, how hopeless he was. But praise be to God who gave us Jesus Christ. You've heard the verse plenty of times. If you're in Juana's, you've heard it's a key verse there. It's one of Debbie's favorite verses, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. How did Paul live his life before when he did it by his own means? He tried to stamp out the church. He was there, as Jacob said, when, when they uh, murdered Stephen, and he approved of it. If he didn't pick up a stone and throw it, who knows? Verse 21 says, I do not set aside the grace of God. Grace is what saves us, what we need to offer to all mankind. Grace that is greater than all of our sins. I do not want to set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now I want to back up and then read those verses. Here's how Paul started off Galatians chapter 2. Then after 14 years I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, the twelve apostles in Jerusalem. I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Even Paul was confused. He's living his life by the Spirit, but he's told that the Gentiles need to be circumcised. They need to do these different things that the law demands, and he's confused because he says the gospel that I preach is, is by faith alone, not by works. So why are the leaders of the church requiring these acts of righteousness? So him and Barnabas go see them. Verse 3, not yet, yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. Let me, let me repeat that again. This was because some false believers... Wolves in sheep's clothing. Goats with sheep. It's something that the church had, always will have, and will have up to the day when Jesus separates those who are true believers from false believers. They were in the head positions there in the church, saying that grace alone isn't good enough. So Paul and Barnabas went to see them. Verse 5, We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. 
As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they, whatever they were makes no difference to me. He's talking about Peter and James. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, there he is by name, who has already written this letter saying, do what you believe. Don't just say it and not do it. Now is guilty of the same thing that he wrote the letter about. Imagine that. How many times have I stood up here and preached to you and went home and not been reverent to my wife or not provoked my children to wrath or not been disrespectful to my mother or father or not coveted? <laughs> That's the tough one Paul had to deal with. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barmas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace, grace, that was given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to, and they to, to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to what? The same thing James wrote about to the Jews scattered abroad that they weren't doing. Continue to remember the poor those that need things in this world, especially Jesus. If you just try to tell somebody about Jesus, but then say, go be fed and clothed, they're not going to hear the gospel message. They're going to see you as a hypocrite. But if you go to them with loving kindness and do the things they need and then tell them about what Jesus has done for you, I guarantee you their ears will be more open to the gospel. Verse 11, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. We're more worried about men than we are about God. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Now, maybe you didn't catch that when you were reading Acts. So Paul talks about it here. This was what was going on even among the elite believers. We fight a spiritual battle. We're going to get to Ephesians soon, and you better believe I'm going to mention the armor of God because it's not our armor. It's God's armor that's able to extinguish every fiery dart from the devil. Because Jesus told me in John 12 that, that he took all power and dominion from Satan when he put the cross upon his back and died for you and I so that we could live that abundant life that he promised. Verse 14, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Jesus Christ that we may just be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really, were, really would be a lawbreaker. For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. How do I do that? Now there's the verse. I have been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live. I live for Him. I died on that cross with Him so that I could be raised up with Him in eternal life. But Christ now lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for righteousness, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now, you should have read First and Second Thessalonians also, which we, Debbie read the scripture of. This is a letter to the church in Thessalonica. Again, they're fighting a spiritual battle because people have told them that their dead people that have passed away before them will not ever see life. That Jesus has already come. All these different things. 
But Paul commends them for their behavior again, but warns them that we're fighting a spiritual battle. In 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 5, it says, You are children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others. We're sanctified. That means we're set apart and made holy. Just like you read about in the Old Testament, those lampstands and different things were set apart. You and I have been set apart. As we'll read in Peter, we are priests, a royal priesthood, set aside, purchased with the blood of Christ, to be His possession, ransomed back from hell, which is the penalty of our sins. Verse 6, So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we have when Jesus returns. He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with Him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care, care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. Something that James had already addressed too because he said you're giving preferential treatment to these people over those people. Verse 14, And we urge, brother, urge you, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else those outside the body of Christ as well. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all, hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through so that you will be perfect, as Jesus said, like your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. May your whole spirit, soul, and body, this tent, as Paul refers to, that we dwell in, this temporary shell, our eternal spirit will live on, and we will receive a new dwelling. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, as the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to live. That's the hope that we celebrate when we celebrate the Christ Mass, the death of Christ, that God's Son would come and die for us. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes in his second letter, verse 13, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits. We're to live as Jesus did, producing fruit. Back in John 12, I remind you, Jesus said, and He's talking about us just as much as He was, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the ground, you won't see a harvest. If you're wondering why you haven't had success in ministry, witnessing to this person and that person, maybe it's because you haven't died to Christ enough. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's because you haven't had faith enough. But I will tell you this, as long as you have breath in your body, give glory and thanks to God and tell others of the hope that you have. Brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord because God chose you as first fruits to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. Verse 14, He called you to this through our gospel that you might share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you will let Jesus take you to the cross, if you'll deny yourselves, take up your cross, whatever that instrument is of pain and suffering and death, and follow after Jesus, I guarantee you of what Paul's words here that echo Jesus' words. 
He will raise you up in life eternal. Remember that as we remember the season. Father in heaven, I do thank you and praise you for this church. I thank you for the spirit that has indwelled us. And I pray for the power of the spirit to live through us more and more as we do deny ourselves. As we realize the same spirit that walked through the prophets of old and the same spirit that walked through Jesus in his ministry and raised him from the dead. The same spirit that turned some fishermen and and zealots into mighty men of God that we see the power of the Spirit proclaimed and we see that people came alive with the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, help us to receive the gifts of Spirit, to share them with one another, to share the gospel in love and deeds as we go through this world. And Lord, let us hold on to the, not only the teachings but the promises of Jesus that He will return and He will bring His reward with us. Let us tell people of the true reason for the season, that Jesus Christ came and died for them. We thank you and praise you in his precious name. Amen.